Father God, thank you so much for our brother Sisley. Thank you um, for his life, uh, for his ministry. Um, Lord, we thank you for Latabo. We thank you for their marriage, for their kids. Um, Lord, I pray that you would continue to protect them and watch over them. It's been such a joy uh, just to see all that you have done um, from at least the start of our relationship, but even before that, God. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless Renewal Fellowship. I pray that you would uh, continue to send people there, uh, people who would be excited about uh, the mission uh, that you have given them uh, to see uh, men and women, young and old, come uh, to the knowledge of your saving grace. Um, and then, Lord, I, I pray that you would save many uh, through yeah. uh, this local church, uh, through this ministry, that, that many would bend the knee and make the confession that you you are Lord Jesus. Uh, you are King. Um, and so even now, Lord, I pray uh, that you uh, would strengthen uh, my brother as he brings your word to us, um, that he would be an instrument in your hands, uh, and that everything that he uh, shares with us would be a sweet fragrance to you. I pray that his words would submit to yours, and that his heart would submit to yours. Uh, we love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Father. Well, thanks again, Onef. Thanks again for the invite. Thanks for me. It's just a joy for me to be here once again. I'm going to jump right into God's word. Um, there's just, I mean, I, I, can, I can share so much. But actually, before I do that, I just do want to thank this church for their generosity towards us. Church planting is such a, a, a tough thing, and it does take generosity. And this church has been generous to us um, financially when we planted. We didn't have anything, and they were the one, this church was the one that sort of gave so that we could plant, um, and also gave in terms of people. Um, so I'm just, I'm just thankful uh, uh, for the generosity, and, and, and that God will continue to bless the work that's happening, that's happening here. We, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 34, chapter 34. I want to read this text for us and pray for us, and then we're going to jump in looking in, into this word. Exodus chapter 34, I'll read from verse 1 to 10, verse 1 to 10, Exodus 34, I'll be reading from verse 1 to 10. Exodus 34, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Cut two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablet which you broke. Be prepared by morning. Come up Mount Sinai in the morning and stand before me on the mountain top. No one may go up with you. In fact, no one should be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and herds are not to graze in front of that mountain. Moses cut two stone tablets like the first ones. He got up early in the morning, and taking the two stone tablets in his hand, he climbed Mount Sinai, just as the Lord had commanded him. The Lord came down in a cloud, he stood with him there, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. Yeah. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations. Forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Bringing the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshipped. Then he said, my Lord, if I had indeed found favor with you, my Lord, please go with us. Even though this is stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin and accept us as your own possession. And the Lord responded, look, I'm making a covenant. I will perform wonders in the presence of all your people that have never been done in the whole earth or in any nation. All the people you live among will see the Lord's work for I'm doing with you, for what I'm doing with you is all inspiring. This is God's word. Let me pray for us. Heaven Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. The word gives life. Your word is life. The word gives light. Your word is light. 
And we pray that now you will open up our hearts, open up our ears, that we will hear your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that it will come upon us this evening, that you will take my words and you make them alive, that they may live in your people. Lord, I pray that what we do not know, may you teach us what we are not, may you make us, and what we have not, may you give us. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It's been, it's been a tough uh, two years or three years. Most of us, we know that. Most of us, I don't have to convince us with that. It's been tough. Um, and I'm, I was just sharing that in terms of church planting and all of those things, that it's been a tough time. But not just in terms of church planting and ministry, but just in people's lives. There's just so many things that have happened th- that have made people really felt like it was a shaking in their lives. A shaking in their lives, shaking in their families, just different things happening in our lives that have made us to, to really question what, what's really going on around the world, what's really going on with us. In fact, it has made people, people who are not believers or people who are not Christians, to really wonder For those of us who still call ourselves Christians, why are we still there? Why do we need God? Why do we need God? People uh, are looking from the outside in and saying, why do we we still bother? Why do we need God in our lives? And And I want us to wrestle with this question. Why do we need God? And what type of God do we need if we do need him? Because there's a lot of wrestling. There's a lot of rumbling around to say, do we we really need God? Do we need the biblical God? And I'm not just talking about the God that people are making up for themselves. I'm talking about the biblical God. Do we really need this biblical God? And if we do, what kind of God do we miss? Or do we need? You know, people are, are saying, you know, why do we need God anyway? People, you get people who have moved away from God and they live with an angst to say they've moved away from God, but they are saying these words of, of Julian Barnes that he has said w- way before that I don't believe in God anymore, but I miss him. There are people around us who are saying that. That I don't need God, but I do miss him. And in our age and culture right now, people, we're seeing people sort of doing the cross, uh, moving in different ways. You have believers who are now doubting, and you have doubters who are tempted to believe. There are so many things that are happening right now. So wherever you are in this room, whether you are that believer who's wrestling with doubt, or you are that person who is not a believer, but who is tempted to believe, I really want you to lean in to our text today on how God reveals himself. This is the God that we need. What does the Bible say about the God that we need? And my prayer is that we will follow through as we examine this God question. We all need to examine this God question. And again, I don't need to to convince you that we live in a world or in a time of anxiety. And I don't mean anxiety in a mental health way, and that's, and that's there, but also just anxiety of this, this annoying angst in our souls that something's wrong, that something has gone wrong with us. The anxiety that says, you know what, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening in my life. I'm wandering my way through this life. I don't know what's happening. Should I take this job? Should I date this person? And we're not just confused about the details of that. We just don't have a bigger story to align our lives with. 
We don't have a bigger story. So we, we don't know, not that we don't know what type of, of things we, did, we need to do, we don't know what type of people we need to become. It's all over the place. We are all over the place. And the truth is, if we're struggling with what type of story we need to be part of or align ourselves with, it's, it's a difficult thing because we are story-formed creatures. We are story-formed creatures. We live in our, in our humanity longs for us to ask big questions. Longs for us to say, well, what's the story of this life? What is this world? What are human beings? Why, why is there suffering and evil? Uh, how do we relate to one another? How do we relate to creation? What, what kind of society should we build? All of these questions are questions that we're wrestling with. We need a story of God to make meaning of our lives and make meaning of this world. We need the story of God. You know, some of us might know this philosopher, an old philosopher was not a Christian, Nietzsche, who said God is dead, but he also said God remains dead and we killed him. And what he meant by that, sometimes we may think of that he's arguing that God, you know, God is dead, let's not believe in God. But what actually Nietzsche was saying, he was saying God should be dead. When he's saying he's dead and we killed him, he's arguing that God should be dead because now we're living religiously by name only, but our lives has nothing to do with God, and therefore, let's just kill him already. You get what he's saying? He's saying we are already living as if God does not exist. Let's just kill him already. Because he's dead. He's dead. And he says that in, the, in, in this vacuum of us killing God, we have, we have to rise, we might as well rise to the occasion and then take the role of God and be the authors of our own lives. And some of us are doing that. And the question is, how is that going? How is that going? How are we doing that project? And to be honest, this is the, for the people out there, many of us, even within the church, we live in that. That, that, that. that functionally we're living as if God does not exist. Functionally. I mean, that's what Oni was saying, to say this whole spiritual and, 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 and that we're living in certain aspects of our life as if God does not exist. When it comes to it, we live as if there's no God. I can decide my own identity. I can decide my own morality. I can decide my, I can make all these decisions myself. But some of us, we're smarter than that. We have re re relegated God only for Sundays. Throughout the week, throughout, he does it. we do our own thing, we'll see him on Sunday. We've relegated God into Sundays. And my heart is that we will recover the foundational truth about who God is. About who God is. It was Toza who said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Which is why today I really want us to sort of go back to the foundation. Let's talk about God. Let's talk about God. What kind of God do we need? And our text today is going to show us three ways that we can look at God, or three ways that the Bible reveals. I mean, there's so many ways the Bible reveals God, but here's, here's primary thing that we see in this text, as God re reveals himself to Moses, as God reveals himself to his people, he is the God who is good, he's the God who's loyal, and he's the God who's revealed himself. The God who's good, the God who's loyal, and the God who has revealed 
himself. What we see here is the Lord revealing himself to Moses on this mountain, the Mount Sinai. And here he proclaims his name. And when you talk about, the Bible talks about his name, he's talking about his essence. He's talking about his character. This is who he is. And God is revealing that to Moses. This is after the people of God have been rebelling and all of these things. And Moses really want to come back again to bring the tablets to his people with the law. And God comes and says, or Moses asks, God, may you reveal yourself to, to us. And God comes and reveals himself to Moses. And he says, I want us to rush through or we go to verse 6. Where he says, the Lord, or verse 5, the Lord came down in a cloud, stood within there, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. The Lord is a compassionate, gracious God. He's slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations and forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. God here, he's, he's sort of giving his, he, to say this is who he is. He's the compassionate, the, the other word, the word there of the compassion is the, is the kind, kind God who's gracious. And, and, and those words together, they are used differently in, 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 in the, throughout the Old Testament. The compassionate and gracious God, and sometimes, the, especially in the Psalms, they will sum those words up into say, this is the God who is compassionate and, 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 and kind or gracious. This is the God who is good. In, in most of the, psalm, in the Psalms, you have this parallelism, which means some of the words that the Psalm will say, they will say the same words, but in a different way. Compassionate and kind or gracious is, is, is the same way in a different way to say God is good. In fact, in Psalm 119, the psalmist says in verse 68, you are good and you do good. God, you are good. But not only that, you do good. Those are two different things. Those are two different things. A bad person can sometimes do good things. You know, I watch a lot of, should I say this here? I'm unsafe. Sometimes I say, I I watch a lot of of mafia movies. There, I said it. (laughs) And sometimes you see with these mafia movies, like literally, like a bad, a bad guy, drug dealer or whatever. And now and then, he, he just, or not even now and then, but he just loves his mother. He would give to his mother anything. Don't touch my mother. And now and then, he will go back to his community and he's giving, doing all these, do, these good things. You can be a bad person and do good stuff. Which is why the psalmist is emphasizing you are good. You are good, but you also do good. God is intrinsically good. It flows from who he is. From him flows goodness. The theologian Boving says, among God's ethical attributes, the first place due to that is God's goodness. The supreme good of all things strive for, the fount of all good things, the good of every good, the, the, the one necessary and all sufficient good, the end of all goods. He is good. He is good. It, flow, it flows from him. He, his love and mercy and compassion, all of these things, they flow from his goodness. He's a good God. He's good essentially. He's good perfectly. He's good infinitely. He is the good of all good. He is the cause of all goodness. We know goodness because of the good God. He's the good God. He's the good God. He's the vast ocean of goodness far beyond 
our imagination. He's the good God. And because of his goodness, his works are good. What he does is good. His word is good. It flows from the good God. I wish we could really get that. His word is good. His wisdom is good. He's the highest good. Friends, if God is powerful and not good, he can bully us. It's not good for us. If, if God is wise and not good, he can manipulate us. He, he has to be good. He's a good God. He's a good God. And, and we are representatives and ambassadors of the good God. Of a good God. And the first thing, and we know this, if you've been a Christian for a while or even as you start being a Christian, the first thing that the enemy attacks and brings doubts to us is the goodness of God. When things go wrong, when suffering comes, he goes straight for the goodness of God. We doubt the goodness of God. You know, I always you know, tell a story. I mean, when I was doing a residency here, it was such a precious time for me. And with the residency, you know, there was a sense of I was like an intern in the church. I'm doing everything at the beginning. I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever you need, I'm there. I'm pick whatever, you know. And I would, I would be assigned certain tasks. You need to start doing this or whatever. I'll get feedback, you know. And sometimes it's, it's just great, but sometimes it's just, it can be, you know, a lot, Especially when you're getting feedback. I mean, now and again, I'll get feedback. You know what? You, st- you know, start this team, start a group. Or what, and then I'm trying to do things, and they're not working. I'm coming back, and I will get reports now and then. You know, sometimes you, you think you're doing something good, well, and actually, no, you didn't do this. You know, you get correction. And, you know, I got to know the leaders of the church and some of the people, especially like the people who were in staff at that time, I mean, they were just, you know, just nice guys, good guys, you know? Um, (laughs) Yes, just just good guys. I mean, just good guys, trust me, good guys. And it was such an assuring thing for me to get correction from people that I know that they're good people because I know that there's no ulterior motive. It's just correction. And friends, that's, that's the whole thing about God. God is good. When, he's, when we, had, we get discipline, when, when, when he allows things in our lives, he, he, we can trust him because of his character. Yeah. It's a good God. Oh, man. It's a good God. Yeah. He's good. So the Christian faith or the Christian story introduces us or it shows us, here's the God you need. And here's the God we have, a good God. But the second thing, the Christian story shows us that we have a a loyal God, a covenantal God. A covenantal God. We we see here these words, it says even in verse 5, as he starts to to proclaim his name, it says, the Lord. And if you see in your Bibles, the word Lord there is in capital letters. And and that's the name Yahweh, and that's the the covenantal name of God. That in, in himself, he's the God of the covenant. In fact, he goes on to say to Moses in verse 10, where Moses says, Lord, if, 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 if we have found favor with you, forgive us. Forgive us, accept us as your people, as your possession. God says, here's what we're going to do. Look, I'm making a covenant with you. And, and that is just the nature of God. We see this. In fact, he's making a covenant again. Now he's making with the people. 
You know, the story of the Old Testament, you see, you see it in different patterns of a person, a people, and then the world. Even when it comes to the covenant, God made a covenant with a person in terms of Abraham. And now he's making with the people Israel. And, and, and when we look at, at, at the, 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 the foundation of the covenant, the covenant, anyway, for those, maybe for some of us who might not know exactly what it is, a covenant is, is a bond, is an agreement, is an oath, is a promise, is a commitment. In our, in our terms here, it could be a contract, but that's a very loose term. But it's a very strong commitment to be faithful to whatever you agree to through thick and thin. That's the covenant. And in the covenant, each, each side makes a vow to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be loyal to this. I'm, com- I'm committing myself to this. I'm going to be faithful to this through thick and thin. And you know, we live in a very, now, when you talk about covenant and loyalty, it's a very foreign thing to us now because we live in consumeristic, you know, times. No one is loyal to anything. You know, you're loyal to a coffee shop or something like that. If they do bad coffee, I'm out. <laughs> you know, you're loyal to, and, and sometimes we treat certain things like that. We don't really understand the nature of covenant. And again, you know, for, for some of us, in a, to understand a classic example of a covenant is a marriage. It's, it's, it, it, it has this commitment that, that is, has, has a legality to it, but also love to it. It's love and law, if you can put it that way. There's something that, bounds, that binds you to it legally, but also there's an organic love that is flowing through that. That's a covenant. And in the story of Abraham, I just want to sort of go through it quickly. When we see the, this covenant here, uh, the story of Abraham, you see Abraham here, just a normal man living in this country of Ur, when out of the blue, God calls him and tells him to leave everything and go to a land that he will show him. And, Mo, and, and, and Abraham does that. You know, he goes. And God promises him that he will make him you know, a father of many nations. Out of him, all nations will be blessed. He will have a seed that will cause nations to be blessed. And then he goes, and then God speaks to him again, saying, I will bless you, and through your offspring, all nations will be blessed. And Abraham says, sure, Lord, let's do this. And then years go by. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And then God comes back to Abraham and says, you know what, we're still on, don't worry, I still got you. And Abraham is saying, Lord, I I don't know about this. What's happening? Where are your promises? There is no child, it doesn't look like anything is happening. I don't understand. What's happening with your promise? What's happening with what, what you said you would do? And God says the exact words that he's saying to Moses now. Here's what we're gonna do, let's make a covenant. And the covenant is God is saying, I'm for real, for real. I'm for real, for real. My promises are true. I'm for real, for real. And, Mo, and Abraham at that time was looking for an anchor. How can I believe you? Nothing is happening. God, where are your assurance of your promises? How will I know you won't let me down? You've been there? And God says, I'll make a covenant with you. I'll show you that I'm for real, for real. I'm for real, for real. And, and in the ancient Near East, those days, I mean, covenants were such a thing that was happening all the time. You know, it was equivalent of, of signing a contract or signing a ceremony of some, of some sort. And it involved animals. You know, at the time it involved animals. And those making the covenant will, will cut the animals and will walk in between that. And what that, uh, in between those animals. And what that symbolized was that if anyone breaks the covenant, they will be broken like these animals. So you don't break a covenant. You know, there will be consequences of, of the covenant. 
You will walk in between, and then, you know, if you don't do your part, I'll cut, off like, I'll cut you off like these animals. Sometimes I wish we could have these covenant like this for, 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 some, for some, you know, these uh, 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 internet contracts or all of these things. You don't do your part, I'll cut you off like that. Now, wh- what happens with Abraham is so amazing. They were both supposed to walk through these animals. And when the time came for them to walk through these animals, God puts a- a- Abraham to sleep. And then God walks through this. And then he wakes him up and says, we're done. I've walked through for you, and I've walked through for myself. I'll take care of the part of my covenant. I'll take care of the part of your covenant. If you break your covenant, I will die. I won't break my covenant, but in case you break it, I will take the, 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 the covenant curse or whatever, the, 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 the death for you. And friends, that's the gospel. Because Abraham is saying, Lord, I don't know if you would do your part, but to be honest, I don't even know if I'll do my part. That's a Christian life. And God says, I know that. I'll do your part for you. I'll I'll take care of your part. And that points straight to the cross of the Lord Jesus. Where he becomes our covenant curse on the cross. That's the God we need. A God who is a covenant keeping God. A a God who's going to be loyal to us when we are not even loyal to him. There are some of us today who are saying, Lord, I've been been bad. I've messed up. There was a time I vowed and I promised that I'm going to do this now. I'm going to walk this road now. And it looks like I've I've gone back. And now it feels like, Lord, I'm that black sheep in the family. A loyal God, a covenant-keeping God says to you, listen, I've taken care of that. I've taken care of that. You have a good standing in the family. The cross has taken care of that. I have made sure that your mess is taken care of on the cross. We need a good God. But we also need a loyal covenant keeping God. A covenant keeping God. That's the, the picture of the gospel that we see here. Are you not sure about God? Are you not sure about the future? Are you not sure about your relationship with him? Are you one step forward, three three steps back? God is a loyal God. He's loyal. He's loyal to his people. Because he's bound in covenant with them. He is bound in covenant with them. That is why Jesus, just before he went to the cross, he's sitting his disciples, they're about to, to partake of, of, of the Lord's table. And, and he says these words again, this table is about covenant. Yeah. What I'm about to do is about covenant. We need a good God, and we need a loyal God, but we also need a God who reveals himself. We need a God who reveals himself. And that's what we see here. He's coming to Moses saying, this is who I am. I am the Lord, the Lord who is compassionate and gracious, who's maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations and forgiving in iniquity and rebellion and sin. And I will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now, what we see here is, is, 
you can read it, it can feel like it's contradicting. This is the God who is compassionate and gracious. This is the God who is abounding in faithful love and truth. But at the same time, he's not bending on his justice. At the same time, he will not live the guilty unpunished. How does this, this justice of God and this love of God come together? And we see this tension throughout the Old Testament. We see this tension of, of the God who is just, even with his people. To say, we, we are bound in covenant, but if you break this, I, I, I'm a just God. He sent even he even sent them to exile, but at the same time he took them back. Yeah. Yeah. Is he good? Is is he about love? Is he about justice? Where does this meet? And it all meets in the person of the Lord Jesus. Yeah. It all meets in the person of Jesus. The, 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 this God, God here revealing himself is actually leaving us with question mark, how does this happen? And, and we see all answered in the person of Jesus. Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3 says, Long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who he has, who he has appointed to be the heir of all things, through whom all things were created in this world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upon holds the universe by the power of his word. It all climaxes on the person of Jesus. It all points to the person of Jesus. The, the faithfulness of God throughout the, all these promises, they find their yes and amen in the Lord Jesus. They found that yes, all oh, the fulfillment of all these promises, God can keep his covenant promises. They all climax in the person of Christ. Yeah. They all find their yes in him. They all find their yes in him. Christ is God's yes to the promises of Ab to the promise he made to Abraham. He's, he, he, he's the God, yes, he's, he's the David of spring who reigns forever. All these things point to Jesus. We read about all of these people and they're all pointing to Jesus. He is the second Adam. Adam where Adam failed, he's the second Adam who obeyed the Father perfectly. Yeah. He's David's offspring who reigned forever. He's, the, he's Isaiah's suffering servant that was wounded for our transgressions. Yeah. He's Daniel, son of man, who will come again in glory. That's the Lord Jesus. Yeah. He's the greater Joshua who brings us to the promised land. All of these things are pointing to the Lord Jesus. He's the true manna from heaven that satisfies our souls. It points to Jesus. He is that water from the rock that saves us. In fact, Paul says that. He says that rock that Moses was talking about, the rock was Christ. It all points to him. Jesus' is, Jesus is work is God big yes to the world. Is God big yes to the world. God has not given us a maybe. He's given us a yes in the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we think that the Christian faith is all about the no's. And there are certain things that the Bible is clear about. But, but the, 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 the Christian faith is a big yes to the world. It's a big yes to the world. He's the, he, Jesus is the answer to the questions that we are asking. Yeah. Can we get forgiveness? Yes. yes. Can we be satisfied? Yes. yes. Can we have eternal life? Yes. yes. Can we be reconciled with God? Yes. Will he have you today? Yes. Oh, amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. He's God's big yes. 
we can be forgiven. He's faithful to us. He's the good God. He's the loyal God. We can serve him. He can rid us of guilt and shame. We can be reconciled. All the promises of God found their yes in him. All of them. What God pledged, Christ fulfilled. What God said he will do, it's fulfilled in Christ. Christ crucified and risen is the ultimate proof that God is faithful. God is good. And that we can serve him. In the person of Jesus, we get to taste and see that the Lord is good. In the person of Jesus, we get to taste and see that the Lord is good. And because of that, because we have tasted this extraordinary goodness of God, we can be ordinary witnesses of God. I can tell you, friends, as I close. Sometimes, you, I mean, you, I don't know, you're calling it a conference or a revival. And we can have these things, conference, revival. And sometimes we can think that what is asked of us when we leave this is that we need to be radical people. We need to do this. We need to, God is asking us to be ordinary witnesses of the risen Lord Jesus. Ordinary. John said, I'm not the Christ, but I'm pointing you to him. I know who I am, but there's one whose sandals I can't even tie. That's the one I'm pointing you to. And my prayer is that as we understand who God is, the good God, the loyal God, the God who has revealed himself in Jesus, that we would be ordinary, ordinary in our work, ordinary our service to God, ordinary witnesses of the risen Lord. We live in a world where we love epic, we love this, we love all of these things. And therefore, that's what we think. And for some of us, it's like, oh, I'm not that, therefore, I, I, there's no place for me in the kingdom. Listen, what's needed? Ordinary witnesses. Ordinary witnesses. And for you to be an ordinary witnesses, you have to, be, to have witness an extraordinary thing. If I have been to, if I've watched maybe Michael Jordan playing, I I can safely say to people and boast even and say, I was there as a spectator to watch this greatness. I'm not going to put myself in the mix. I wasn't there. I'm not part of it. I'm just happy I was there. I witnessed it. If maybe your big rap or whoever he is, I was there to see this person do this, and I watch greatness. I, I can't be like them. They're like, I'm just a witness. Friends, we've experienced an extraordinary grace of God. Yeah. While we are yet in sin, Christ died for us. We were dead in our trespasses, walking in the ways of this world. We were children of wrath. But God in his mercy, he has saved us through faith. And now we can be witnesses of his greatness. This is the God we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you that you are good. Thank you, Lord, that goodness overflows from you. And thank you that you are a loyal God. You are a God who keeps covenant. You are a God who is loyal to us, who pursues us. But he has revealed yourself in your son, the Lord Jesus. Help us to love him. Help us to treasure him. And help us to be ordinary witnesses of him. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.